Hosea 4, 6. Hosea 4, 6. My, My people, people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. knowledge. Because, because you have, have rejected, rejected knowledge, knowledge I, I reject you from, from being a priest, a priest to, me. to me. And, and since, since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will, will forget, forget your, your children. children. Lord, we ask you, Holy Spirit, we ask you to take this word and to penetrate <coughs> our hearts and minds. We ask you to deliver your message through me today and that we all receive. We receive only what you have for us coming from your heart, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, uh, my, this is very, very true. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And how do we get knowledge about God? How do we get knowledge? We have scrolls at home. Yeah, we, have, we unravel our scrolls and read, read them on our Bibles, in our Bibles, on our, online now. We are saturated by the Word of God. It's every single place. And churches everywhere. Churches everywhere. Different names, different titles, different denominations. Is that good or bad? I ask you that question. Well, so many churches compromise the Scriptures. There you go. So we need to know which ones do and which ones don't. And, and now you've got other religions that teach other concepts and things. You've got Hinduism and and uh, Buddhism and all of these other isms. Uh, but there's also, and those will cause you to fall away from Jesus. Clearly, they're not leading you to Christ. But then there are Christian groups, Christian denominations or teachers that are teaching a lot of the Scripture, but not all the Scripture. And they might be confusing people and leading them in the wrong direction. And that's what we were talking about this morning, that we need to be a check on every word, all of the knowledge we receive from teachers. And our filter, of course, is the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. You will be destroyed by what you know or don't know. It's not just being a member of something, a church or something like that, that's not going to save you. What will save you is that you believe you have the right faith in the right thing. You can have a lot of faith in the wrong thing. You can have a false Jesus that's being presented to you and a partial or incorrect gospel and you've got 100% faith in that partial knowledge and you will be destroyed. I want to have 100% knowledge of the gospel and of Jesus Christ. And I want to have 100% faith in that message. Because nothing else will save you. Whenever you add something or take away something from that message. And what is that message? We find it in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, I didn't mark this, but if um, you want to go there. Uh, okay, 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, I did mark it here. I guess I go there a lot. Uh, now I would remind you, this is Paul speaking, brothers of the gospel I preach to you. Please, always go back to this. I've repeated this many times, but why? Because the knowledge of it will save you. Which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. This is how you're saved. This knowledge will save you. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You see, now there's another message in this. It's not just believing the gospel from the beginning. It's continuing to believe in the same gospel until the Lord calls you home. Because you're saved by grace through faith. Faith, that is what they're trying to erode. And the, and the devil's plan is either to get you to believe in a partial or a corrupted gospel or to reduce your faith in that correct gospel. Either way, he's going to win. This morning we talked about... But Derek Prince was talking about three demons. He was talking about hundreds of demons, I guess, but three particular ones. As he was casting them out of a woman who would appear to be a Christian, the first demon that gave its name was uh, secure, eternal security. In other words, you believe that once saved, always saved. And that's taught by, I'll say it, the Baptists. That's a well-known denomination, isn't it? Church on every corner. 
that can screw you up, man. That'll take, you say, oh good, I said the prayer, I got baptized in water, I'm good. I can do whatever I want to do and I can believe whatever I want. No, no, it's all the way to the end. Amen. And don't get too comfortable with yourself because you and I are flesh. And if we don't hold fast to what God said, we don't hold fast in relationship to him, we are in danger because of what we believe or don't believe. And then, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. You see, the Scriptures have to speak of the salvation and the forgiveness of sins. That's the way you know. Scripture. Scripture means the written Word of God. It's a check on what people are going to teach you about the forgiveness of your sins. And what is included in the forgiveness of your sins, it isn't, as we said this morning, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. It isn't your pronunciation to say, I believe in Jesus. That alone is not what leads to your salvation. But if you take the full gospel and you take what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and the people were convicted about their uh, what had happened to Christ and what they were doing in their belief or not belief in Christ. And Peter said, the solution to your problem is repent and believe and be baptized. Repent. So saying yes, Lord, yes, Lord, without repentance is not the complete gospel. And you are not saved without repentance. And repentance has two meanings, one in the Greek, one in the Hebrew. And one is you're turning away from a sinful life and you're turning to a holy life, to the laws of God. You're saying, I don't want to live like that anymore. I'm choosing God's laws. And then the other one is I've turned away from not believing in Jesus and now I believe. And you need both. But a false gospel will say, don't worry about that. Do what you want to do. Live how you want to live. You said the prayer. You got baptized in water. You're safe. You're good. Don't worry about it anymore. And that's a false gospel. That he was buried. You have to believe that Jesus Christ came in a body and died. There are false teachings that say that it didn't happen. That he, that he was just a spirit. That's a false gospel. And I'm not going to... There are so many false teachings out there. I can't... We're not going to talk about every single religion and every single false teaching, but just know that he chose to come and be born of a woman and that he lived just like you and I did. He felt pain. He felt emotion. He had to eat. He had to do all the bodily functions we did. And then he died just as a man would die. He chose to do that. He didn't have to do that. He laid down his life as a sacrifice for our sins. And he was actually buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. You must believe that he lives. If you have a doubt about that, the devil has gotten to you. He has caused doubt to come into your mind and say, did he really rise from the dead? That is corrupting your salvation. You must believe. And that's revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to people. I'm not going to go into that further, but people saw him alive. Do you, have you experienced him? Do you know that he's alive? Yes. You know, now he's different. He's, he has a transformed body. He's a transformed function. He's risen and he's put out his Holy Spirit into those who believe. And he has equipped us to live, to live if we choose to, by the power of the Holy Spirit as he lived. He has given us the ability to allow him to work through us if we let him. And we are different. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 2 Corinthians 10, 12. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. This past week, I've heard multiple false teachings and just, just things, false doctrine from multiple people. It was all at once, coming in from different directions. And I thought, what is going on? And now I see that people will be talking to someone that they respect or someone who might have some kind of spirituality to them. And all of a sudden, they're listening to them. 
This, don't trust what some other person is telling you just because they seem to believe it strongly. You know, look that thing up in the Bible. Double check with spirit-filled believers. Am I getting this right? Is this correct? But ultimately the Bible. And don't just live on YouTube. There's some great pastors and teaching on YouTube. But you'll notice if you go to a hundred different ones, you're going to get, whoa, I'm confused. I don't know. This guy's saying this. He's a... Today we, we went through that, uh, as I said, the first demon that Derek Prince cast out of that woman was that eternal salvation demon. The second one was Jesus only. That you can't baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you have to baptize only in Jesus' name. There's a whole bunch to that. And I just don't, there would be a whole sermon on it. But there's a whole denomination that teaches that. Jesus only. It's called oneness theology. And they do everything else that's Christian, but then you get this strange, peculiar thing leading off. Well, that's a demon. And then uh, the no pork, no bacon demon. So now if you hear a Christian saying, I don't eat pork, that's a demon. We know this, that in the book of Acts, that we see that the sheet is coming down, that God releases this vision to uh, Peter, and Peter had never eaten any unclean animals. He was still living off the old covenant, even though he was saved. And God said, enough with that. There are no more clean and unclean animals. And I, he said, take and eat. So now he says, you can eat any of these foods. Don't live by the Old Testament dietary restrictions. And by the way, the reason I did this is to show you that at one point, Gentiles or non-Jews were considered unclean people. But now I'm saying that no longer pertains. He's showing the representation of the old Jewish law had a greater meaning. And he says, now go to the Gentiles. Don't be afraid to go into their house. Don't be afraid to go to what you thought before was unclean and share the gospel and eat their pork and their barbecue and all that other stuff that this man likes. <laughs> Put on the... <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yes. Don't compare these other false... Te don't eat up false teachings. You must protect yourself from them. Parse through the word and know that. Now, uh, there are two, this is interesting. There's a 1 Timothy 4 and a 2 Timothy 4, and both of them talk about false teaching. I don't know, just happened to be that way, I guess. Anyway, 1 Timothy 4, Paul is instructing his pastor, his young pastor. Paul the Apostle is instructing his young Apostle, pastor, friend, Timothy. And he wants to teach him and get him up to... This is his seminary. He came into this uh, by watching Paul's life and also by uh, Paul's letters to Timothy. This is how he raised up pastors. And we would all learn a lot from Paul, I would imagine, that by demonstrating through relationship, you see a spirit-filled person who's strict on the scripture and is speaking into your life these truths. And you can become a leader of God's people. You can become someone useful to Christ if you stick to the scriptures and emulate godly lives. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, this is 2,000 years ago, so it's a later time now, uh, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits. And the King James says seducing spirits, and I think that's important. And teachings of demons. Derek Prince gave us three examples. So we don't want to fall into the false belief that I have my salvation because I said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. We don't want to fall into the false belief that I can only eat certain foods. Seventh-day Adventists uh, have dietary restrictions. Uh, and so do um, people who falsely believe in a messianic gospel that, that, that includes the restriction of eating. And then that third one was Jesus only. Yeah, that is a false gospel. Um, and teaching some demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage. Who forbids marriage? We just talked about that this morning. Catholics. There you go, Catholics. Let's call it as it is. Let's say what it is. And require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Amen. Amen. 
Don't be fooled, man. They get into all of these little things that pull them away from focusing on the main thing, which is the gospel. Um, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. And then uh, Paul tells Timothy, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. That's what I'm doing to you today. Because I am not that smart to come up with my own teaching, right? So uh, let's teach what the Bible teaches. And that's exactly what it teaches. And it'll keep you out of big trouble. Being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Not just good doctrine, but the good doctrine that you have followed. So not not just the Bible study is not going to get there, baby. I mean, that's the start. But we got to follow that Bible study. We have to follow the word. We have to put it into our life in action. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. And those teachings that I just told you are irreverent, silly myths. Have nothing to do with them. Rather, train yourself for godliness. So you have those that always are telling you about the Bible, but there's no godliness in their life. And you have to train yourself to be a godly person because it's not automatic. Even if you have the Holy Ghost, even if you've been baptized, even if you said yes to Jesus, even if you read your Bible one time, uh, you need to train yourself to be godly on a regular basis. Uh, Would anybody like to give a testimony on how they need to train themselves on it? No, we don't have to do that. But um, (laughs) the struggle with the flesh, the struggle with sin. If you want to be a good athlete, you have to be in training. (laughs) Our friend here cannot get up on those high mountains and come down at 100 plus miles an hour if she hasn't been training. And it is the same for a Christian who wants to be effective and disciplined in their walk every single day. I, I made a mistake the other day. I've been really good about how I've been speaking, I thought I was anyway, speaking to people about these, these projects that I help manage and, and lead. And, but there's a couple guys who are, they're talkers and I just, they're really smart, you know, they're very smart, but they're going in these circles, and I said, like, dude, get to the point. It just really annoys me. And and I know they're kind of doing this so that they can fool people, so they can, you know, get... So so I keep asking these questions, like, okay, so, you know, let's give me a straight answer here, dude. But it's it's squishy, man. And I was talking to another guy who's a a very good project lead, and and I start expressing my frustration about these other two guys. And then I thought, why did I do that? He doesn't need to hear my, you know, it's all kind of gossipy, kind of slandering, you know? And it's been convicting me these past three days. And I can't, it's like I can't go to him, the guy's not a Christian, and say, <laughs> it, for us, I think it's one of the biggest problems we've got, you know? So, uh, but, but to myself, I'm repenting. And I said, God, please forgive me. That was... Now, what I said was true, but it just wasn't right. You know, I shouldn't have done it. But, the, but this is, I'm happy about one thing. Not that I said it, but I'm, that I was convicted by it. Because well, when you know the Word and you've got the Holy Spirit and you make a mistake, it's like, ooh, no, I, I can't, it stinks. There's a smell here about me. Ugh. You know? And then uh, you want to change. And then you start praying to God to do that. That's the power of the Word of God if you really believe it and you follow it. Mm-hmm. So um, I just confess that I feel a little better now. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> but godliness is a value in every way. Mm-hmm. Every way. As it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. By living a godly life. Remember, we're the bema to the seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. You and I will be judged by what we have done in the body, whether good or evil. Mm -hmm. evil or good. So there's an eternal consequence to your behavior and how you respond to the Word. And if you also begin to believe false teachings, false doctrines that say you can live any way you want, once saved, always saved, yikes, you're accountable for that. Especially now since we just talked about it, you're accountable for it. I don't want to do that. 
I want to go strictly by what the Lord told me. Um, <laughs> command, this is verse 11, command and teach these things. That's what I'm doing right now, to myself included. Okay. To you guys and to myself. Let no one despise you for your youth, Timothy. <laughs> but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. And that's the other thing. Aren't you concerned when someone preaches and they have no references to Scripture? I was listening to one guy the other day from a very well-known spirit-filled church, and they do have a lot of good teaching, but they rotate their pastors through, and it's a huge ministry. And this guy starts talking about the dangers of distraction, and he's talking about his cell phone, and he's going on and on. And then my wife said, why are you listening to this? I said, because I'm waiting to hear the scripture. I want to hear if he gets to the scripture. Well, after about 16 or 17 minutes, he got to one verse. 20 minutes, exactly. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, and he briefly mentioned it, and he goes back on this story about distractions and cell phones. Yeah. And I thought, this is crazy. And people all around the world are logging in and listening to this. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a waste of time. Mm -hmm. So don't do that. And, and look for preachers that are holding themselves accountable to the Word, not to illustrate beyond what is written. And I was giving the example of someone, we were at a conference, and then someone is preaching about Paul, but he wasn't preaching about what Paul spoke in the Bible. He was preaching about an extraneous description of what Paul looked like physically and using that as part of the message. And, and why? Mm -hmm. You don't know that it's true. Mm -hmm. Stick to the Word. You, can't you give me a message that is based on the Word of God? You have to bring in this other entertaining speech mm -hmm. and that I don't know is real or not. But as I'm listening to it, it was a really good sermon and, uh, because it was captivating and it was interesting, but it wasn't biblically based in that part. He was just using that to make a message that he wanted to fit. Don't do that. It's got to be the other way. We have to look at the scripture and then fit our message to the scripture, not bringing in things. So this is the point I want to make, so I'm going to grab this stuff and put it into my message. That, that that's not, can't be led by the Holy Spirit. And what is taught must be in action. Set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. I must demonstrate what I preach. Oh, hard stuff, right? So, uh, but this is, it means nothing to me. But as we were talking uh, this morning, as Brett brought up, you know, if there's a false prophet, but they're preaching the word of God, maybe their whole life is screwed up, but the message they give is actually scripturally correct. It is possible for you to benefit. And, and Jesus mentioned this about the Pharisees and the scribes and said, don't do what they do because they don't follow what they say, but you must listen to what they say when it is the Word of God. And that's always going to be true. But I don't want to be the one with a big mouth about the Gospel and the Bible, but then in my own life it doesn't mir mir mirror that at all because I'm the one who's on the hook. I might be helping everybody around me, but I don't want to be the one going to hell after helping others. And the scripture says that too. And, it's, and then he says in verse 15, practice these things, immerse yourself, dunk, baptize yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Are you making progress? Check yourself. Are you making progress on these things? Not just telling people more and more about what you read. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Persist. You don't stop. Keep going. Don't be so proud about all your past testimonies and all your great revelations and all the times you did this in the church and, and oh, that pastor said this. I'm always weary of, pastor so-and-so said this, pastor so-and-so said that. What about you, dude? What about you? What's going on in your life? And just because he said it, did he do it? I don't know. I have no idea. Persist. By so doing, you will save. By so doing, continually to do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 
continue to do. Don't just talk. And now we go to 2 Timothy 4, 2 to 5. Preach the word. Just putting more emphasis on this. That's what you should be going to hear, the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Exhortation is a passionate delivery because you believe and you care. And when I hear pastors preaching without passion, I mean, you can be passionate about the wrong thing, right? We're not talking about that. But I'm talking about passion about the word, passion about the pure gospel. If you care, you're going to preach as if tomorrow's the last day and you've got to give, or today's the last day, and you've got to give the right word. It's not like, I don't, humor sometimes, okay, you know, is all right, but if your whole message is just entertaining and funny, Who's going to be on edge? Who's going to be convicted? Who's going to want to change and comply with that word? It shouldn't just be entertaining. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Don't do that. Don't look. Don't find someone who's teaching what you wanted to believe. You must go to the gospel. You must go to the book and, and, and find out what's real and what isn't real and trust the word. Je Thomas Jefferson cut out the Bible and rearrange scripture and verses to suit what he thought was better. Okay. Don't do that. That's a really bad thing to do. And don't wander off into myths. But see, now, the, the, the YouTube Christians, you know, that, that if, it, if it hasn't been demonstrated to you, if, if you don't have someone you know that's a valid source and they're pointing you to somebody, you can end up in all kinds of crazy teaching. Don't, don't allow that to happen. Suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Don't rewrite the Bible. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. When I started this, I, I mentioned the seducing spirits. Some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful or to seducing spirits and teachings of demons. That's what I gave this example that at that conference about the, the, the original assemblies of God, where one man has this sudden revelation. And then through that man, he, has the, he spreads this to other people. The sudden revelation should never divide the Word of God or the people of God. It should have been there 2,000 years ago. It should have been made clear to us, right? So that is just one example. They seduce. Many times women are the source of this seduction to men and vice versa. If you're relying on someone, someone will drag you away. We were, I was, I'm going to go right here. So there is, um, oh, let me, let me give you this. <laughs> when I was in the Air Force, I was really fit, and I looked good in my uniform. So I, yeah. it's hard to believe now, but um, I had square, you know, got the gig line, all this. And I was, you know, pretty fit. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, they, I wanted to get out of doing all of these menial tasks at officer's training school. Because you, you, they'll make you scrub toilets and all this other thing. <laughs> so they had this option, you can volunteer to be in the choir. Well, I can't sing. You know, I have no idea. I've never had any training. I can't. So I go in there and I stand in the back of the choir and there's a whole bunch of us there. I had to think of the same thing, you know. But I looked okay. So as long as I looked okay, and I, singing without any words coming out, I'm all right. This is off we go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sky. Okay. Well, they wanted, they, they were a little suspicious about all these people standing up singing. And maybe it didn't sound quite right to the choir director. <laughs> So he let me go for a few weeks, and then he had this tryout. <laughs> and he said, okay, you're going to have to sing, and I'm going to... He, he sat there at the piano, and he goes, bing, 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 uh, sing in the key of C, or whatever, you know. 
I don't know what he's talking about. What are you? <laughs> so I just start what I thought was singing. And he goes, okay, well, let's try a different one. Like, are you a baritone or are you a bass? Or, uh, 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 I don't know, you tell me, man. Okay. So he did a couple, and then he said, okay, thank you. <laughs> and then I was kicked off the choir. But they kept me on the roll, so I still didn't have to clean toilets and stuff. They forgot to remove my name from the list. He just wanted to get rid of the bad voices and all of this other thing. Favor. <laughs> This should be a symbol. This should be a representation of what I'm talking about. Just because you're standing up as a Christian and you look good and you sound good and everything you're saying sounds very biblical, but you're not singing the same note. The Holy Spirit should be saying something's not right here. And you should be singing the same song. It should be coming right out of the, the music book. Everybody should be on the same music book. And uh, if someone's not supposed to be in that choir, you call them out. Test them. But the Bible says this. What do you think about that? Ooh, you just hit a funny note. But don't forget to remove their name from, the, from your list. <laughs> if you hear preaching and something's not right, take them off the list. Don't listen to that anymore. Because if you keep out of habit hearing the same teaching from a... Say you get saved and all you're hearing is one teaching. And there's one thing that's not right and everything else is right. And at first you think, oh, I don't know. But over time you keep hearing it. And you allow yourself to hear that same partially correct and partially incorrect teaching. After a while you're going to think that is the truth. No pork, no bacon, Jesus only, eternal salvation, you can't lose it. You keep hearing those things. You keep going to the Baptist church that keeps teaching that you will never lose your salvation, right? Or you get into a group that says don't eat pork, eat kosher, even though you're a Christian. And then after a while, you think that that is true teaching. And then you start arguing with other people who say, wait, but the Bible said that you can't hear that anymore. You can't, I remember I was in a church that didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues. Now, the, But that didn't sound right to me because I remembered the, what the Bible said. But if I didn't keep seeking, I kept praying to God, God, show me this one. I, I don't know anybody who speaks in tongues. Could you please help me with this? And it was written into the, into the, the non-denominational denominational code of this church. It was a Bible church and they claimed to be non-denominational. But, but they had a statement of faith and belief. So what you, is that a non-denominational church? So they formed their own denomination, I guess. And then they said, there's no more speaking in tongues, no more active gifts of the Spirit. Now, if I kept going back to that church, that's what I would have to consume and believe and support. But then the Lord took us away, thank God, took us to another country, introduced us to a Spirit-filled believer, who showed me the right way, and a pastor who was spirit-filled and showed me the right way, and then I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. But if I stayed in that old mindset, in that old group that I was used to, and that was all I knew, I never heard anybody speak in tongues, I would still be like that. When I was a baby, I was brought to the Episcopal Church. That's all I knew. But I thought, this is weird, man. This, I get nothing out of this. They sprinkled water on the baby and they said, you're baptized. When my daughter was born, I didn't know any better. We had her christened. So she gets this thing, you know. And then, uh, but it's like, I don't even know what we're doing. Why are we doing this? We got her a nice little dress. They poured water on her head and that was it. Um, but I wasn't saved. So later on, when I actually got saved, and then people said, no, you have to be baptized, and then the Holy Spirit speaks to me and breaks down that teaching, because initially when I got saved, I thought I don't have to be immersed in water because I've already been baptized. Well, someone asked me about baptism a little while ago, and uh, if you go to Acts 19, Paul encounters these men from Ephesus, and he says, have you heard of the Holy Spirit? He said, no, we have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. And he said, well, then... In what name are you baptized? Which takes us back to Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if you had been baptized that way, you would have heard about the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul's saying to these guys. Go ahead and read that. But see, if you're used to one way of thinking, 
You'll not, you're not going to hear what I'm telling you. And then he says, well, how were you baptized? He said, oh, we had John's baptism. But remember, these guys were called disciples of Jesus. That's how they presented themselves. But Paul's picking through. He's sing to me in the key of C. He wants to hear what their voices sound like in the choir. And if it doesn't sound right, he's, let's try again. Let's try this. And then he finally says, that baptism is invalid. That was a baptism of repentance. So he says, now I'm going to baptize you in the name of Jesus. He says, in the name of Jesus. And that goes in with that, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he baptizes them, and they get filled with the Holy Spirit. But their original teaching and training was John's baptism. And they thought that they had everything to be followers of Jesus. But Paul knew that they did not. So he made sure that they were baptized correctly, that they had heard of the Holy Spirit, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues. And now how many denominations did I just whack off right there in Acts 19? <laughs> So, all of them, just about all of them. Um, so, don't, if you're relying on your old baptism, on your old training, you're going to be stuck. There should be something there, mm, I'm not sure. Why are these other things a little bit weird? Or why don't I feel right about this? Um, so now, when someone says, I was baptized as a baby, and I ask the question, did you believe in Jesus Christ? No. My parents had me baptized. Okay. You must be baptized like those men from Ephesus. Oh, wait a minute. You are baptized in a non or a pseudo-Christian religion like Mormonism like we were talking about? Or Jehovah Witness or one of those other cults? Now, if John's baptism was insufficient, what about one of Joseph Smith's baptism? Huh? <laughs> So now you definitely need to be rebaptized. If you now, I've been at places where I've seen the spirit Moroni come out of Mormon believers. They manifest demons. And Derek Prince gave those three demons this morning: no pork, no bacon, the uh, Jesus only, and e eternal security. And he cast demons, all three of those demons, out of people. All denominational teaching. I want to be in line with the Word of God, in spite of what I was originally taught. And I had, God had to take me away from all that false teaching. The infant baptism, against the Holy Spirit, against speaking in tongues, not understanding being born again. All you had to do is go to church and do good deeds. You have to leave it. You have to leave John's baptism and all the other baptisms. Now, I just wanted to point something out about Mormonism because this thing came up. The current teaching of Mormonism is not racist, but the Book of Mormon is. It talks about black people having the mark of Cain. Right? It has, in other words, sin is equated to blackness. And uh, Brigham Young used to talk about, and you know, there are other major uh, spiritual leaders, um, would say that as you get sin-free, you also become white. <laughs> you might as well join the Nazi party. I, I, I don't understand. So now they have, they have uh, renounced these teachings, but it's still in the Book of Mormon. And uh, to see that any, anybody could possibly be attracted to this. Now, I'm sure they don't tell these new converts, any of this, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Just because that name is in the title doesn't mean that's what you're getting. Now they believe that Jesus was the brother of Satan. Do any of you believe that? Oh, God help us, please. No, right, okay. Something's wrong right there. Now they also taught, and Brigham Young taught, who was one of their church founders, that um, Adam was a god. And that his goddess was Eve. And they were perfect until he sinned and then he fell and then he wasn't. Because he was supposed to populate this planet. The, did you know that the closest planet to God's throne, according to the Mormons, is the planet 
Korob, something of that nature, if I could find it. Begins with a K. I believe it's Korob or they believe they can actually identify the planet that is near God. And they believe that all of us can become gods. And we will have our own planet and have our own spirit children. Because Jesus was one of them. Jesus had God and God was on a planet. And then Jesus came and this was Jesus' planet. And then he had spirit children, or Adam did. Uh, and we're, we're spirit children. Now... They also, now Joseph Smith was a Mason, and, and unfortunately my vantage lineage had this Masonic background, which I renounced. But in Masonry, they have different forms of handshakes. And guess what you need to know if you're a Mormon to move up to higher levels, ex exaltation in the, in the spiritual realm. You need to know different handshakes. I'm talking about after you're dead, and you go through this spiritual progression or exaltation. And you get that by, by works. These things are revealed to you at each stage. Now they build wonderful looking temples, but you can't go into them, into the main part of the temple if you haven't paid your 10%. You can borrow the money and they'll let you go on loan and that you'll have to pay them eventually. Does this sound like something you want to be in? Mm -mm. The planet Kolov. Thank you, Carla. That's it. Now, Joseph Smith was the mayor of Nauvoo, Illinois for a while, and he instituted all of these Mormon teachings. And you were not allowed to marry people of another race. That was just horrible. And um, no black person could be uh, a, a priest in the Mormon church until 1978. What are these, what are people thinking? Why would, I mean... Uh, how could you join something like this? I, I, I cannot fathom this. It, they, uh, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young reasoned that black skin was a result of the curse of Cain or the curse of Ham. They used these biblical curses to justify slavery. Young believed the curse made black people ineligible to vote, marry white people, or hold the priesthood. Successive church presidents continued to use the biblical curses to justify excluding black men from priesthood ordination and excluding black men and women from the church's temples. Go ahead, sign up. Now they have renounced that, but let me ask you something. If the founder of the religion believed that, how much renouncing can you do? It, it, it would be like Paul saying, oh, everything Jesus taught was wrong. I'm sorry, that was wrong. Beyond me. Beyond me. <laughs> now, have nothing to do with this junk, please. Now, I could get into the Jehovah Witnesses who don't believe there's a hell and only 144,000 will go to heaven. And by the way, their leader proclaimed multiple times that Jesus was coming and he had them meet on a mountain because that was going to be the day they were going to be taken up. Oops, I got it wrong. I got it wrong multiple times. Oh, and then they also have a magazine called The Watchtower, which has more authority than the Bible. And you can only learn the Bible through the Watchtower magazine that they put out. The Catholics also did this. Oh, you're not allowed. To, this is going back a few years, but the, you were not allowed to have a Bible if you weren't a priest. And they, would ex, they could excommunicate you for having your own Bible. And their services were in Latin because the people, they, you know, they don't need to know. You know, they don't understand. You can only learn from a priest. You can't learn on your own. You'll never know it. Continuing to control you. Extraneous teachings that go beyond the Bible and Scripture. The Book of Mormon is written, even though if I take you to the last page of this wonderful book in Book of Revelation, this should be a red flag for anybody. I warn you, Revelation 22, 18. Everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. You want to add a book to this? You want to add a word, a, pen, a, a period? And that's where I feel a little uncomfortable when people take Matthew 28, 19 and say, 
Not Scripture. Or how about Mark 16? Mm, not Scripture. Now there's a reason. There are older manuscripts that also have errors that are omitting those. <laughs> I hear the Word of God. <laughs> but because you've taken a corrupted copy from an earlier generation of, of, of the Bible... And now you hold it up and you say, well, this can't be right. No, no, you've got to look at all of those existing manuscripts. And then you also have to take what was church teaching like at the very beginning. This is a whole other uh, session. But I want you to see how deceptive and how evil this is. It's evil. False teaching is your greatest enemy. Arm yourself. Arm yourself with the Word of God. Arm yourselves with the Holy Spirit. We are in a, deceimy, a deceiving time. Oh my. Now let's do this. 2 Corinthians 10, 5-6. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Destroy them. Destroy false teaching. Don't let the demons come in and drag you away. I have this one image to leave with you. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. You are saved by grace through faith. Grace. God's grace is eternal. God's grace is complete. God's grace never leaves. But your faith is what draws the grace into your life. Grace that keeps you from going to hell. Grace that gives you forgiveness. It is your faith that God has given you that attaches you. It's like a balloon with a, with, or a kite with a, a cord on it. Without that cord, you are not attached to it. That's the faith that you have. And the devil wants to release the faith from the truth and he wants you to let go of that or he wants you to attach to something else. Keep that faith and strengthen it. Work it through your life. It, your life, your eternal life depends on your faith attaching to the eternal grace of God. So will he ever leave his, will his grace ever terminate? No. But your faith that draws the power of that grace can be endangered. And that's your job. Just keep what he gave you and add to it. Make it stronger. Make it stronger. Don't ever let go. Don't ever let go of your faith in Jesus and the true teaching of God and the gospel. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you, God. We thank you for your word. <laughs> your word will offend us when we don't believe the truth. And God, for those of us that have been raised in another, uh, among another faith or another group of uh, Christians and, and perhaps a partial um, misunderstanding of, the, of your true word is there, God, we ask you uh, to, to open eyes. Just let people see the word and really test the word. Not just accept everything they've heard. Test it. Try it. And God, I pray for all of us to hang on to the true faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. That we're not confused. We rebuke confusion in Jesus' name. We rebuke doubt. In Jesus' name. We rebuke any false teaching that has been added to these words, to this book. We will not accept the Watchtower magazine. We will not accept the Book of Mormon. They are demonic, seducing spirits. And God, we will not allow Satan to seduce us through our friends or family or anybody else. Or some boyfriend or girlfriend that, that it seems nice and attractive, but they have this this seduction to them that is going to lead us away from standing on the truth. I will not believe anything that is not in your book, God. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, convict us. Convict us of any false doctrine, false teaching, and that we don't add things that you have already taken away. That eating food does not lead to purity. That wearing a prayer shawl doesn't make us more holy. That carrying around a crucifix or rubbing beads or any of these other things, they have nothing to do with our salvation or our sanctification. We don't need Judaic symbols. We don't even need the, the symbol of the, uh, of the menorah or even the shofar. None of these things are going to add to our salvation. 
or speaking Hebrew or Greek. I am made holy through my faith in Jesus Christ and the gospel and how I live out my faith. Had nothing. And all of the gyrations of religious groups and all of the pronunciations and they're Maybe they speak in King James English. Whatever it is, it's not going to make them more holy. And people who fake the things of the Holy Spirit, that they fake manifestations, that is not holy. That is ungodly behavior. Lord, only a pure heart. Give me a pure heart and a pure mind. And Lord, I pray that I demonstrate your word by loving others, but not accepting their false beliefs. Not compromise. Thank you, Lord, for calling out the Nicolaitans. Thank you, God, that you are pleased when we rebuke Jezebel, when we rebuke sexual sin and immorality, when we rebuke drunkenness, when we rebuke all of the sins of the flesh, and we don't tolerate the teachings of Jezebel. We don't tolerate any corruption of the gospel. And but God, let us start with ourselves. Lord, we ask you to check us. We ask you that we are being checked daily, all the time. We don't want to live by false teaching or false beliefs. I pray for the people, the men and women in this room right now. God, I ask you to give them and me a spirit of discernment. That we don't walk around stumbling through YouTube videos trying to find one answer here and one answer there. But instead, first we ground ourselves in the Word. And we use the Word as a measure, a filter on every pastor, on every denomination, on every, every teaching that we hear. And we believe your Word over anything that is corrupted or goes against it or is extraneous to it. We don't worry about hurting feelings by speaking the truth. And Lord, I pray for the single people here. That they're not deceived by people that Satan sends into their lives. People with false beliefs, false teachings. Or they don't like the hard edge of the gospel or the preaching that comes from the book. Lord, let them not marry or become entangled or even to have sexual relations with these people. Because your word says that if I join myself with the body of a prostitute, we become one flesh. God, joining ourselves with people with false beliefs. I don't want to do that either. And I don't want to do it spiritually or physically. And pe people who don't like me, God. Oh, Lord, if I said anything wrong, you point it out to me. Point it out to everybody. It's not about our feelings. It's about the truth. Holy Spirit, I ask you to work upon us. Dissolving false doctrine and the doctrine of demons and seducing spirits. And everything we learned before from other denominations and other teachings that took hold in us. We renounce those. We break those off. We're not going to be led by those things. And we're not going to let the habit of listening to them affect us. I cut that off now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Please pray. Don't be so quick to keep repeating what you heard. Put it through the filter of God. If someone said it to you, don't just shoot it out. Check it. Check it carefully. pray for a spirit of repentance for anyone who's holding false doctrine right now. That they've picked up some doctrine of demons or false teaching or who are laboring their lives under a false prophecy where someone said you will do this and you will go there but it isn't from you. God we renounce those things. We pray God that individuals have the voice of the Holy Spirit to check 
all prophecies given to individuals. And we weigh prophecies given to us by the Word of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, I come against all demons, seducing spirits and the doctrine of demons, the demons behind those false doctrines. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. I command you to leave. Let go of us. Let go of us. We don't want you here. We reject you. We renounce you. We hear the voice of our shepherd only. Holy Spirit, point it out. Let the fire fall. Let your fire fall, separating us from false teaching. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray in tongues. I ask you, uh, Lord, to give us uh, an opportunity now for interpretation which we only will receive coming from your Holy Spirit Lord we ask you to silence every other spirit that no false prophecies or interpretations will be released right now Any, uh, anybody hear anything or feel something? Yep. Um, I saw like a, a soldier, it was, I think it was like a Roman soldier and he was all gold. Hmm. And then later I saw like a big battlefield and everyone was like at war. Amen. So put on the full armor of God. Did you see the sword? I saw, yeah. Hmm. yeah. The word and the Holy Spirit. And protect your mind with the helmet of salvation, right? Amen. And that's how we have to fight. And it's not a game. It is definitely a war, a battle. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I saw totally different than that. I saw a mountain and a red sky um, and a cross. Well, there is scripture that says that we can, talking to the Jews, that you can discern the season by looking at the sky and it's, I think it's like a reddish cloud that comes over in Israel and it means that there's a certain weather pattern that's coming up and Jesus says you can do that but you can't discern the times and it could that's the first thing I thought of when you said that that we can discern that this is the end times Christ is coming because of all of the things that are occurring anybody else have something Jennifer I saw uh, Jesus washing What do you think that reminding us to wash each other's feet or that we have to stay continually clean? We have to, uh, I, I think that God put our family together and He wants to sanctify us and He wants us to be a hands and feet for Him. So this is, this is, and I see only, I see the people and I see faces. 